evening, everybody. Good evening. Good to see you. Glad you're here. We are, uh, as you can see, a little bit shorter in number, but that kind of comes with the season. But I'm glad to see everyone. And uh, this evening, I'm going to share a little bit about the National Day of Prayer and and uh, what's uh, what's going on there. So. That'll be our agenda this evening. Just to let you know, next week, um, I'm going to be meeting with an African-American church down in the city. And so uh, Steve Brown will be guiding the Bible study next Sunday evening. And it's been a good while since uh, you've heard from Steve, and he's always a blessing. So uh, that'll be next Sunday, I, uh, next Sunday night. Following Sunday, of course, is Mother's Day, and we'll not have an evening service. So um, anyway... <coughs> That's what's going on on Sunday night. I appreciate very much each of you being here. And those of you that uh, have come or are interested in coming to Pet Club, my understanding is this, this week uh, on Thursday, we're going to take the bus over to Illinois. Have you all heard anything about that? Or do you know where we're going? It's Bootsy's. 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 Oh, Bootsy's, where you took us. Okay, Bootsy's. I never had heard. Well, have you guys heard what time we're supposed to be here? I don't know. 11. 11. 11 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, so if anybody would like to go with us or if you'd like to become a token old person, uh, all you have to do is show up at 11 o'clock and uh, we'll have a good time, enjoy the fellowship. And I can tell you from experience, it's good food. So uh, we'll look forward to going over there. Okay. A couple of other things to. Uh, to share with you this evening, uh, I failed to mention this morning uh, that um, uh, Jerry and Margie Bishop were not with us. Those of you in my Sunday school class may have noticed they weren't in Sunday school either. Um, I found out yesterday Margie has pneumonia, and uh, so I'm sure they would appreciate your prayers. And then, of course, the folks that I mentioned this morning, and, uh, you know... I have a big foot. I also have a big mouth. And I'm grateful because sometimes I insert my foot and it fits very nicely. Um, this morning, you know, as I try to do, I was working around the back part of the room greeting, you know, during the, the welcome time, Johnny. And, uh, and so I came up to Mike and, and Sheila Parker, and uh, their daughter and son-in-law were there, and I knew that their daughter was expecting sometime very soon. And anyway, as she's sitting there, you know, I noticed that she had this little covering on, and I didn't think anything about it. You know, ladies do what they do. And uh, so anyway, uh, and they're standing up greeting everybody. So I bowed to her husband. What's his first name? Patrick. Patrick. I, anyway, I mouthed to Patrick, how's your wife doing? And he said, doing fine. Okay. What I didn't know is underneath that little covering was a baby that was born last week. And I didn't realize. So I found out at the end of the service that uh, uh, Mike and Sheila are new grandparents and, and the baby's doing fine. They named her Rebecca. And uh, I, was, I was glad for that. So anyway, uh, so interesting things have happened. And uh, for... For those of you who weren't here this morning, we have a new member. Once again, God has added to the church. Paulette Meyer joined the church this morning, and we're very grateful for that. And uh, we anticipate David, her son, joining at some time down the road, and I'm looking forward to that. But Paulette, welcome to the family, and we're glad to have you. All right, anything we want to pray about before we, or before I lead us in prayer? Anybody? Um, just as a reminder, Larry Lauer, to my knowledge, is the only one we have in the hospital. We want the news that I picked up long ago, a few minutes before leaving, about seven people on their way to the Baptist Church in Baltimore that were shot. One died. Oh. The seven people. I don't know. Anybody else hear anything about that? Sounds good news. Okay. Um, I can look it up right now. I missed that, so I didn't know. And of course, uh, you've probably heard about the folks at the synagogue in California yep. um, that uh, were shot. Yeah. By the way, someone was asking me, uh, because they've been saying on the news that it was the last day of Passover. And somebody had asked me this morning about that and said, well, I thought Passover was last weekend. Okay, they have Passover 
And then they have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a week-long festival that sort of undergirds Passover. Of course, as you know, at Passover, they would eat only unleavened bread. And so the two fit together. And so that's that's what was going on. And uh, so it's, you know, uh, just, I guess, in, in, as a common reference, it's easier to refer to it as Passover. Because if they said it's the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, people would say, what's that? You know, so anyway... Uh, that's what was going on. So let's let's go to the Lord together. Oh, Margie, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought that um, you were saying that continue to remember that he's the instructor now. Oh, he is. Praise God. Okay, this is Margie's brother-in-law. Right. And then you mentioned also Virginia this morning. In Virginia, yeah. He's uh, he's crazy. Okay. So Dean's having surgery this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Bless his heart. Well, we certainly will be praying for him. Okay. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Ed, would you lead us, please, sir? Father, as we come here this evening, we are thankful for the food that we have and the fellowship that we have. We ask you to uh, help those that have been mentioned tonight, both in healing and in dealing with the afflictions that they have. We're thankful for a pastor who faithfully preaches the word from the scriptures, Father, and we just ask your special blessing to, to continue on him and help us as a congregation to always support him. And Father, uh, just thank you again for all the blessings that you give to us. So many. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Johnny, give us a couple minutes and then uh, lead us in. Let's do two songs tonight, if that's okay. All right. Tomorrow. Wow. 
That's a good thing. Come on. Anyway, if you want, turn in your handles to 355. Join us, we sing the song Speak to My Heart, written by B.B. McKinney. Thank you. 
Okay. This is a this is a difficult time of year for me. Um, in terms of, of what to do with our Sunday night Bible studies because of all the interruptions. There will not be a service Mother's Day. There will not be a service Memorial Day. In June, we have our quarterly business meeting, so we won't have a Bible study that night. So everything's segmented. And so I'm always appreciative of suggestions, and Ed gave me one just a while ago, and I appreciate it. And so uh, the Sunday after Mother's Day, uh, our Bible study will be entitled Demons, Demons, Demons. <laughs> okay? And uh, um, some of us have been studying the Gospel of Mark in our Sunday morning Sunday school, and uh, the subject of demons has come up several times. And it's one of those things that sort of like a pendulum. Um, you know, folks get very interested in it, and then they don't think about it at all. And then something happens, and, and the subject comes up again. But over the last few years, and Ed mentioned to me a while ago, you know, um, we're hearing conversations in, among some in the Catholic Church about exorcism again. And, um, and so, you know, there is that awareness. And uh, uh, anyway, so... Just wanted to let you know, that'll be in three weeks. Steve Brown next week, Mother's Day the following, the third week, will take up demons, demons, demons. Okay, um, this Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. And uh, for, for a number of years, um, and, and all of a sudden my mind's quit, um, James Dobson's wife, uh, and I can't think of her first name. Sure. Shirley, thank you. Uh, headed the National Day of Prayer. And, um, and then two years ago, uh, a Southern Baptist pastor who had been president of our convention, a man named Ronnie Floyd, uh, was asked to take the helm, which he agreed to do. And so last year and this year, Ronnie Floyd has been the uh, uh, sort of the volunteer head of the National Day of Prayer. Um, you've heard Ronnie Floyd's name because he is the newly elected, uh, uh, well, for lack of a better word, director of the Southern Baptist Convention. He is the president of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, he will assume that responsibility later this month, has resigned from his church uh, I believe it was called Cross Point in uh, northern Arkansas, and, uh, and we'll be moving to Nashville and taking on that responsibility. Uh, Ronnie Floyd has been an influ influential leader among Southern Baptists for a number of years, and uh, certainly I pray for him, pray that he'll do a good job. But um, uh, at least for the present time, he has been leading the National Day of Prayer. The National Day of Prayer has gotten varied acceptance. Uh, there was a time when churches pretty generally um, observed it and participated in it. And it's been one of those things that has kind of slipped out of focus, or as some people say, off the radar the last few years. And I think part of that is because the way it's been promoted and so on and other things that have been going on that have distracted from it. But I've always felt that it's important that at some point during the year we pause and specifically pray for our nation and, and about our country. And so um, uh, when I was at South County, we, we actually had a service on the National Day of Prayer. We've not done that here. And, um, and interestingly enough, no one has even requested it or suggested it. But I still think it's important that we observe it. And so we're going to pretend that tonight is the National Day of Prayer, okay? So uh, in your mind, pretend it's May 2nd. And I want to give some attention to it. But there's some things I'd like for you to think about. Um, and uh, one of those is what our Baptist faith and message says about citizenship. And so uh, I've reprinted that here. God alone is the Lord of the conscience, and he has has left it free from the doctrines of, and commandments of men 
which are contrary to his word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. Civil government being ordained by God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal, and this implies the right of free and unhindered access to God on the part of all men without interference from the civil power. And so that's been, you know, uh, longstanding as our Baptist position on what it means to have, quote, religious freedom. Um, in uh, Romans 13, Paul says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Now, if you put that in context, Paul wrote that to the Christians in Rome. Okay? When the Roman Empire was, so to speak, at its heyday. And when Christians across the empire were literally being persecuted for no other reason than because they were brave enough to call themselves Christians. And, and so it is against that backdrop and against the, the heavy hand of Roman domination that Paul makes this statement. It was not an ideal government. It was in many ways not even a moral government. And yet Paul says, as Christians, we have a responsibility to honor the civil authority and to accept the civil authority as ordained by God. And that's not always easy, is it? There are things that go on in our government that we may find objectionable, things that go on in our government that we may even feel persecuted by, and yet uh, we, we have that mandate that we are to honor government. The National Day of Prayer calls into attention a positive tension that exists between a free church and our desire for a moral society. And so with that in mind, Peter also said, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. You may recall that when Jesus was crucified, what was the charge? He was not crucified for heresy, though that's what the Jews charged him with. Why was he crucified? Putting himself up as king instead of... That was the perception. Um, and, and of course, uh, Pilate justified his execution under sedition. Okay? He had, he had uh, uh, set himself up uh, in rebellion to the authority of the state, even though Jesus made clear that was not his purpose and that was not his goal. That was what uh, actually the charge was. And the charge, of course, in that case was more to satisfy the uh, Jewish authorities that were demanding his crucifixion than it was to fulfill any Roman law. <coughs> but Pilate was the only one who had the authority of execution, and he chose to exercise that authority. And I share that with you because 40 years later, this is what Peter writes. Okay? Uh, and so um, there has... There has always existed that tension, that institutional tension between church and government, between religious responsibility and civil authority. Our nation came into being because of Christians 
who felt pushed in their faith by the rules of state. And, and so uh, there are countless examples. Okay. The Baptist faith and message also says all Christians are under obligation to seek and make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human society. In the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism, every form of greed, selfishness, and vice, and all forms of sexual immorality. We should work to provide for the orphaned and needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. Okay. Seeing that word vice, did you notice this morning that we were encouraged while we were singing to raise our vice? <laughs> One of the reasons that I have always appreciated church work is that I get to make my mistakes in front of God and everybody, okay? And our youth do a really outstanding job of preparing for and providing the dialogue for each of the songs that we do each Sunday. And it was simply the misspelling of a word, but I was grateful that there was not a congregational gasp or a congregational <laughs> chuckle right at that point. We just kept on moving. And, uh, and I chose not to say anything about it this morning. You know, I just chose to leave. I'm sorry? They were chucked in silence. Oh, were they? Okay. Well, I appreciate the discretion then. But anyway, so again, our Baptist faith and message makes very clear that as a part of our statement of faith, we do have and need to acknowledge a relationship that exists between us as Christians and the society in which we live, and the government under which we are responsible. Okay? So, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that the church has two influences in society. And he uses as metaphors for those salt and light. And some folks interpret salt that we are to be a caustic agent in our society, or a corrosive agent in our society even. But I believe not as an irritant, but as a preservative. The purpose of salt in the first century world was not to destroy meat, it was to preserve meat. And, and its value was as a preservative. And so we are in a position where in our faith, we need to be concerned about our society and preserving the integrity, both morally and ethically, of the society of which we were a part. And the other is light, not to blind someone or, or to expose them to something, but rather to enlighten them, to make them aware, uh, to inform them, and to guide them. So Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And then of light, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And so those two metaphors suggest to us that as Christians, we don't have the right to ignore our society or to cloister ourselves like monks and, and withdraw from our society. And, and so, again, there is that positive tension that exists. Many years ago, E.Y. Mullins, who was uh, a Christian uh, apologist and theologian, wrote what were called the axioms of religion. That is, the foundational or basic assumptions by which we as Baptists exist. And one of those is referred to as the religio-civic axiom, which says a free state does not create religious liberty. Okay? Religious liberty, in other words, is not the product of these United States. Rather, the state recognizes and respects a religious liberty that already exists in the province of God. Okay? And so it's important for us to understand the difference. And I'll come, up, come back to this in a moment. Religious toleration, a privilege granted by man, or religious liberty, a right bestowed by God. Okay? One of the debates that has raged is whether or not the, uh, 
the Declaration of Indi or excuse me, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights gives us freedom in religion or freedom from religion. And so over the last 40, 50 years, we've had these ongoing debates about whether uh, uh, it's appropriate to have prayer in schools, whether it's appropriate for a teacher. And, and of course, uh, you know, it's, it's been interesting to observe over the last decade or so how many different ways that has been divided. In some cases, they've said, well, it's not okay for a teacher to pray, but it is okay for a student to pray. And it's not okay to pray during school hours, but it is okay to pray after hours. And it's not okay to pray in the building, but it's okay to pray out in the yard. I mean, you know, there, there are all kinds of ways that people have tried to address this and deal with this, but it, it continues uh, to be a thorn in the side. And so, for example, uh, the perception that there should not be prayers at the beginning of high school football games, uh, you know, that uh, and, and all of that. And so on and on it goes. And uh, it is a continuing thing. So what is religious liberty? Religious liberty is the mother of all true freedoms. It is rooted in the very nature of both God and man created in God's likeness. It implies the competency of the soul in religion. By the way, that's another one of Mullen's uh, axioms of religion, the competency of the soul. Uh, anyway, it implies the competency of the soul in religion and denies to any person, civil government, or religious system the right to come between God and man. Okay. It is different to say, I don't want to pray, than to say, I don't want you to pray. Okay. And that's part of the struggle that our society has been going through for literally two generations, okay? Now, the Bible says, over in Galatians, Paul writes to them and says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> In the wall that is religious liberty, what the New Testament teaches us is that love is the mortar that holds those bricks together. And if there is not a foundational, institutional sense of loving one another, then we lose the mortar that holds those bricks together that makes that wall stand. And that's why I think the theme for this year, uh, if you noticed in the first slide, for the National Day of Prayer is love one another, taken from John 13, 34. Okay? So, the world says, okay, churches should be promoted by law. Okay? Now, think about that. As, as I read through these, decide, am I going to vote for this one or against this one? Churches should receive tax assistance. Okay? And what that means is that the government should send us a check every month to help us do the important work that we do. Okay? The United States is a Christian nation. Okay? Churches and government cannot cooperate, and Islam should be illegal in the United States. Now, Notice, that's what the world says. So let's take a moment. Let's pause. What do you say? Churches should be promoted by law. There should be a statute that says you have to be in church somewhere every weekend. Whether in Jewish or Islamic on Friday night or Saturday or in a Christian church on Sunday. You have to be in church somewhere. Ed, you're shaking your head no. Absolutely not. That's what... And that's what a lot of what, uh, for example, the Puritans did in, uh, in Massachusetts about the time with all the witch trials and stuff. Everybody needed to be in church. Everybody had to be in church. It was, it was authoritarian. Mm -hmm. You couldn't deviate. Okay. And, and the interesting thing was the Puritans <coughs> left England to try to get away yeah. from that kind of religious intolerance. 
And so it wasn't that the Puritans were opposed to religious rules. They were just opposed to other people's religious rules. They wanted to enforce their rules. And so, uh, yeah, that's okay. Churches should receive tax assistance. Okay. Anybody in favor of that? Okay. The United States is a Christian nation. Okay. What does that phrase mean? Because we have heard that phrase in the last few years. What does that phrase suggest to you? Definitely Baptists or Catholics or the people that believe in Christ should be the ones here. Okay. Okay. All right. Or that the Christian church, in whatever form it may be embraced by the state, uh, is, is the endorsed or promoted form, okay? Okay? On the other hand, and, and that's a two-edged sword, there are those who use that same, well, that's, that's a silly idea, to avoid acknowledging the Christian heritage of this nation, okay? Um, and so, uh, again, uh, you see efforts to uh, remove statues or to uh, change the carvings on over the, the lintels of our courthouses and our buildings. Uh, people wanting to take the doors off the Supreme Court chamber because it has the Ten Commandments on it, for example, and, and things like that. Okay, churches and government cannot cooperate. Separation of church and state should be so official that churches should have no part, no participation in any way in our schools, in our government, or in any civic institution. Okay? Because there, you think there's an institution, let's call it the church, and you're saying you can't participate in government, but the, uh, you know, the Alps can, and any other institution can. Okay, any other thought? Well, the problem is that there's no such thing as any constitution that separates the church and state. That's right. It says Congress shall make no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free you know, exercise thereof. Exercise thereof. And that doesn't say anything about separation of church and state and that they can't cooperate. Okay. And then finally, Islam should be illegal in the United States. And one of the challenges that we face is likewise religious liberty is a two-edged sword. And if I am to enjoy genuine religious liberty, I must be willing to extend religious liberty to someone else. That is the liberty to practice their faith as they see fit or to decide to practice no faith at all. As I was coming to church this morning, I had to be careful that I got that I didn't get run over by the people who didn't want to go to church this morning. Okay, and um, and there were a fair number of them on telegraph. So, um, okay, so so we have again that sense in which there are things that we would like to do. See, um, things that I'm opposed to. Going back to to prayer in school a while ago, one of the sticky points in that is okay if we were somehow to lobby for a law that it's okay for teachers to lead a prayer in school by the way when i was a boy we said a prayer and we did the pledge of allegiance every day every day in a public school okay uh one year we just said the lord's prayer every day because one of our teachers she felt like that was appropriate but we did it every day okay and and so of course now they oppose that. But the problem is, suppose your teacher is Islamic, and so they want to lead you in prayer. Or suppose your teacher is Buddhist. When I was at South County Church, we had um, what was called uh, English as a Second Language. It was one of our outreach ministries, and we had a number of folks from other cultures who came to our church to learn to speak English so that they could function more effectively in our society. One of those families who became very involved and, and became good friends with some of our ESL leaders uh, said that their granddaughter was getting married and they would like to use our church. Would that be possible? 
Well, the teacher wanting to be as accommodating and as sociable as possible said, well, I'm, I'm sure we could work that out. And so she contacted me, and as I spoke with the individual involved, he said, now, we'll be sure to clean up our altar. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, what, what does that mean? He said, well, we're Buddhists, and so we're going to need to build an altar in your fellowship hall so that, that we can have an appropriate observance for this wedding. Okay? That was not okay. <laughs> All right? So anyway, uh, the, the, the problem sometimes, you know, sometimes we seek a 50-cent solution to a $5 problem. And so we could say, all right, here's the solution. It's okay to pray in school. But then we come back and realize, Al, going back to what you said a while ago, maybe it's a Catholic prayer. See? And maybe a Baptist student sitting there doesn't understand why we're not praying to God, we're praying to Mary. You know? So, okay. All right. Threats to religious freedom. Okay. <clears throat> Unnecessary government control. Overbearing special interests when morality is cast to the wind and laws that are passed that make no sense. Okay? Any question about those? How can you have morality without God? Well, there is a basic sense, and, and um, both Paul addresses this, and, um, um, and I'm trying to think of where else uh, it's addressed in the New Testament, that, well, Paul does in the first chapter of Romans, that everybody has some life. And so there are societies that aren't necessarily Christian, may not even be religious, but they are moral. You know, they recognize the difference between right and wrong, for example, uh, as, as you and I would recognize it. So, but... There's a difference between right and wrong, might be very different. There are some places in New Guinea, for instance, by, where killing somebody else is that's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And, and again, what the scriptures say is that there is a basic sense of morality that respects the rights and the privileges of another individual. And you've given an example of one society that doesn't. Uh, but in our society, the perception of morality is, is always a challenge. What is morally right? Okay. Well, I'd like to spend more time on this, but I need to get on because I have something I want to finish with. Separation of church and state. Church and state are mutually related in the normal affairs of life. Okay? Church has been dominant in my life today. The government will be dominant in my life tomorrow. See? Um, in terms of how fast I drive down the street, I'm doing a, an internment service tomorrow morning down at Jefferson Barrick Cemetery. I'll have to obey the civil laws. I'll have to stop at traffic lights. Uh, even though I'm sitting next to a Presbyterian, I'll still have to wait till it turns green and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, uh, we cannot exist in our society and not be involved with government at some point. But at the same time, neither should exist to protect or profit the other. Do you agree with that or disagree? Want to vote? All in favor say aye. Something for us to think about. Okay. Another point. Christians are called by God to be loyal citizens. Okay? The New Testament makes that clear. Being a citizen is not synonymous with being a Christian. That was one of the problems that existed if, if we adopt or, or enforce the phrase, we are a Christian nation. Some people make the assumption that if I'm an American, I must also be a Christian. And, and so they assume that being a Christian is synonymous with being American. And finally, voting is a responsibility, not just a right. One of the things that Brenda and I have tried to be very deliberate about is when there's elections, whether it's for the school board or the fire board or the president of the United States, we feel we have a responsibility to go and exercise not our right to vote, but our responsibility to vote as citizens. Okay. The Bible says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay. Well, we do not have a king, but we do have government officials and authorities. 
And so it applies. Threats to a moral society. Immorality and perversion. This goes back, Wayne, to what you were saying. Greed, gambling, and crime. Prejudice and bigotry. Corruption in government. Abort, abortion and euthanasia. Okay? And unfortunately, and I've, I've done this slide some years ago, we could ask now, uh, or add now same-sex marriage if we wanted to. Um, okay. The acts of a sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. I had a uh, New Testament survey professor when I was at Oklahoma Baptist University that as he was teaching Galatians, he pointed out to us that everybody has a besetting sin. So you ought to at least pick one that you really enjoy. <laughs> okay. Kind of a twisted irony of that. Okay, that's not what he meant. Notice, Paul continued, but the fruit of the Spirit, and by the way, I would call attention, it says fruit singular, not fruits plural. Some people treat this like a, a, a menu that you get to choose from. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? And so you really should read that if you understand it. Paul is saying the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so on. Unfortunately, some people would read it love or joy or peace or patience. Okay? He continues, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus has, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. So, some things to think about. Okay? As Christians, we are called to be change agents in our society. That goes back to the metaphor of salt and light that I shared with you a while back. I do not have the prerogative or the privilege of a Christ, as a Christian of simply divorcing myself from the things that go on in our society about which I should care and on which I should exercise some effort, whether it is the effort of sharing my opinion or the effort of contract, uh, contacting those who may be in official capacities, um, certainly in my prayer life uh, and, uh, and in my uh, influence of others. Uh, if there are things that are going on in our society that I'm concerned about, I have a responsibility to speak about them. We are in the world, as Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer in, in John 17. We are in the world, but not of the world. And redemption, not rebellion, is our tool. Okay? Um, there have been times in, in world history when religion has been used as the excuse for war. Okay? Um, it, is, it is to the embarrassment of our legacy that sometimes that has been true. And finally, we are called to pray for our nation and our leaders. And so that brings me to the last one. How should we pray? And I want to conclude tonight by asking you to, to join me and let us pray together for our nation and its leaders, for integrity in our government, for peace in our world, and for wisdom in solving the problems that we as a society face. And uh, so let me just stop and ask you, what are things that as you observe the National Day of Prayer, that you would want to pray about or that you would suggest that we would pray about? Anyone? How can we expect the immoral people to elect a moral leader? Well, unfortunately, that's true. And, uh, and we are seeing in the, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, 
we're, we're seeing in, in the demographics of our society uh, how much that's being influenced, okay? Um, and, uh, and leaders are, are charged to act legally. Unfortunately, they're not charged to act morally. That becomes an issue of personal integrity, and that's where our responsibility to vote becomes important. But on the other hand, I believe we're responsible to pray for the leaders we have. Amen. And, uh, and we can't ignore them. But what else would you add? Pray for love. Pray for love? Okay. All right. Certainly that's the theme of our National Day of Prayer this year. I never really had a fear of keeping my hands together to fight for it or whatever. But it's not going Well, there have been times <coughs> when hate has taken on a racial identity. But unfortunately, over the last few weeks, it has taken on a religious identity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are some, even in our church, who object to the fact that we have a police officer uh, on our front porch <coughs> every Sunday. <coughs> Never thought about that. If you'd have asked me 10 years ago, was I in favor of it or was it necessary? I'd have said absolutely not. Uh, this is not that day. And uh, uh, as we see played out, and again, Brenda mentioned it, I don't have any knowledge of it yeah, at this point. I'll be watching tonight. But whatever may have happened in Baltimore, and of course we hear about California and we remember about the synagogue in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, uh, so unfortunately, over the last, what, five, ten years, a number of churches have been attacked. And it's in in part because they are perceived as a as a soft target. Rich? John, that kind of church that was shot in Baltimore. Oh, what was it? The two cookouts they were having and one person opened fire while the cookouts were taking place. One person was shot and two or three others were just picked off. Oh, okay. So okay. It's not, well, it's not a church. Okay. Well, Channel 2 apparently created the impression it was a church. Okay. Or a church, or a church group. They may have been having a kite flying or something. <laughs> okay, what else? One of the tensions that we face in our society, in our nation, and in our community is loving our neighbor and embracing those who are coming into our nation or to our country illegally and are seeking refuge and of course depending upon who you listen to uh, in our government right now whether they are seeking safety and sanctuary or whether they are seeking prosperity and opportunity um, and uh, and the challenge is perpetually there to um, to say, okay, as a Christian, how should I react or respond to those tensions in our society? Um, you know, we don't have a large Hispanic population in, in the St. Louis area, but they tell me we have the largest Bosnian population outside the nation of Serbia. And, uh, and so, um, you know, there, there is that positive tension. How, how broad... And I'm reminded of, of the lawyer that asked Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? And Hessel's free translation of that question is, who do I have to love? And so that, again, is one of the tensions that faces our society. Okay, let's just take a few minutes. And uh, let me invite you to bow your heads and we'll just have a time of prayer. If you would like to pray out loud, I would encourage you to do that and give you an opportunity, whether it would be just a brief sentence or uh, if you feel led to pray on, uh, certainly to lead us in prayer. And after everyone's had an opportunity who would like to, then I will close us in prayer. But let us be in a time of prayer for uh, 
uh, in, in observance of this drawing together of our nation in prayer. Dear and Father, we do just thank you again for this another day. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life. Lord, we do just pray for this country. We just pray for the leaders of this country, Lord. And sometimes we don't understand what goes on, but Lord, we know you're in charge. You put kings, you put presidents in, in position, Lord. You're the one that did it, not us. Many times we think we're the one that's in charge, but it's you. And Lord, you preordained these things to happen. Lord, you put this man in office for a reason, Lord. We just pray that you would just guide and direct him, Lord. He's learning moral, but Lord, he's doing things that I think that are spiritually right for us. I just pray that you would be with his administration. Pray that he would choose people, Lord, that would understand the right things. Pray, Lord, that your spirit would guide and direct these people that, that direct him. Lord, I just pray for our whole country. I pray for the evil in this country, Lord, as we're killing. When I was a child, Lord, none of us was like it is. Lord, this country is so wicked. People say we're a, we're a good people, but Lord, my Bible tells me that we're, we're unrighteous, we're, we're unholy, we're a wicked people, and without Christ, we're nothing. So, Lord, I just pray for this people. Pray for this land. Pray that you fill this land. Pray that you help us to humble ourselves and turn to you. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for the things that you're going to do. In Christ's name. Lord, I just lift up at this time a prayer of concern and a request, Lord, for a spiritual revival in our country. Yes, sir. Is there a time that as a need, as a country that needs to be on its knees, it's now. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we've been, as Christians, we've been quiet and silent as we watch things that have transpired in our country in the last, the last, say, 25, 30 years. And Lord, we need to ask forgiveness for that. We yes. pray that we might be bold, that we might stand up for our convictions what we know is right. We pray that in doing so that we would be able to spread the word of your love that you have for the people around us and for this nation, that we might show love to others that you would have us to show. We just pray for the leaders of our country. And Lord, even in saying that, I, I pray for our news media. Yes. I pray for them, Lord, that they would they would be aware and know how they have so quickly turned things and what they've done to our country. Yes. We just pray for convicting power to be over uh, those that, that present the news, that it might be truthful, that it might not be one-sided. And for the, even the printed press, it would be one-sidedness there. Lord, we don't even know who to believe. We just want to place our trust fully upon you, that we would be you be our guiding light through all this, that in doing so, Lord, we hear you and pray for holiness on our part. Forgive us for when we have failed our own country. Mm -hmm. We ask these things in your name. Father, in the waning moments of this day, we thank you that we've had the privilege and the liberty to worship you, to follow what we believe are the instructions of Scripture and the guidance of our conscience in how we would worship you and address you, proclaim you, 
and share you. And so, Lord, as, as we come to the end of this, as we call it, Lord's Day, we want to thank you for the liberty that we enjoy mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that it is your gift to us. And in our exercise of it, help us remember that religious liberty is not just the liberty for what I do, but for allowing others to do what they do. Father, I do pray for our president and the members of our Congress. I pray for the institutions of our government, in our nation, our state, and even here in our county. For Lord, there is a need for integrity, for honesty, even for morality in how decisions are made, laws are enacted and implemented, and how institutions are treated. Lord, I pray for our schools and our teachers. Yes. I pray that you would give Christian teachers the courage of their convictions that when they are challenged to teach or to provide information that is contrary to what they recognize your word teaches, that you would give them the wisdom and the discernment to navigate through those very difficult choices that may be thrust upon them. And I pray that you might give to them the resources they need to be a beacon of light and to be salt in the lives of the young people who they influence. Lord, I pray for our church. I ask that as an institution of our community, like our government, like our schools, even like our homes, that we as a church, a body of Christ in this place, might acknowledge the privileges that we enjoy and the responsibilities we bear that we are not of the world and that ours is an otherworldly hope, but yet we are in the world and we are responsible for it and to it. So as we this night add our voice to hopefully many other voices that will be raised over this next few days and particularly on what is designated as the National Day of Prayer, Lord, we appeal to you as our Father and as our guide, as our Creator and as our Lord, that you would manifest that your will be done and that those things that are done in our society and in our government and even in our church are acknowledging that you are indeed in charge. Because you are, we trust you to take us safely to our homes tonight, mm -hmm. to watch over us this week, the things that we do. May we honor and please you in the choices we make, the words that we utter, and the things that we do. Give us the strength and the discernment to resist the temptations that are all around us so that when we come to the end of this week and the beginning of the next once again, coming together as the body of Christ in this place, we may worship you with joy. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. And everyone say it? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Glad you're here. Thanks again for the food. Rich and Shelba, thank you for sharing leftovers with us. We appreciate it.